Alrighty then. Oh, all right. As always, start with a bit of a stretch. Feel that crunch in the shoulder. That's the universe's way of saying, you need to do more yoga. And clearly I'm not doing enough of it, but you know what, we're going to continue anyway, it'll be fine. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, non-binary folks of all ages, I'm doing some reverse engineering tonight. We're going to, we're going to do some, we're going to do some, what I would, I don't want to call it advanced crochet, but I think if it's, if you want to kind of get into, if you want to kind of get to grips with like crochet, which is essentially quite tough, okay, this is the kind of thing maybe you should take a look at, right? Reverse engineering old patterns. And I have this by special request. Uh, a local seniors residence right, gave me a massive quantity of yarn, just a lovely mercurized cotton yarn. This is some of it. This is nice white stuff here. And there, they gave like three giant like garbage bags full of yarn. Like it's enough yarn to keep me busy for quite a while. And they were nice enough to. They basically said like you, you know, you can have this stuff for free, all right. But we've got a special request, all right. We've got this thing, this old dish cover, what you call it, and we kind of need a replacement. We need more of them. And and I was like, you know what, you know what, okay, you know what, I could do that. I can absolutely do that. You know, like I can, I can, I say, you know what, I'm I'm game for anything. I'll have a go. That was all the only thing they wanted. They're just like make us a few more of these. You know, if you're if you're the the craft, you know, the artisan we think you're, make us a few more of these. So now, I get to reverse engineer this thing, and we're going to figure out how to essentially make another one of them. I can go through in a second essentially what it is. Hey Matthew, how's it going? For reference. Today we have strawberry, and this is my last can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we are with this, right? What this consists of, okay? Now, I think they've actually been using it inside out, believe it or not, because if you turn it over and switch it like this, you can see that there's a very definite kind of squash here. So it's essentially been, <laughs> it's been stored like this flat, okay? This is actually the back side, okay? The back of the stitches. If you turn it over here, I can tell that this is the actual right side of the stitches, or the side that you would actually show it when you're working. So it is kind of a little bit like back like that. So the way that this is gonna work, all right? Now, what we are dealing with here is like, it's old cotton, it's been taken care of, but it is, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's no spring chicken or whatever anymore. And we are gonna have to start in the center and essentially work out the stitches stage by stage in order to recreate it. Now, I'll just move this. Here we go. I'll remove that a little bit. Okay. All right. Here we go. So where we are with this is that I'm pretty sure that this here is essentially the same thickness. All right. This is like this was made what like crochet by and large is done with mercurized cotton. It's done very like it's essentially for lace, you know. Yes, for covering dishes. Now, the very nice lady said that they have a lot of IKEA dishes at bowls that just happen to be this size, and rather than use the silicone, <laughs> the silicone covers, they wanted something that was a little more. How did she say? In keeping with the period aesthetic of the residence, because it's an older historical home that just happens to be a senior's residence. Okay place was amazing by the way when I walked into it it was like stepping right into the 1910s and I was all about it I gotta say it was lovely but yeah so so here we go we are going to work this one out all right and this is probably going to take me quite a while I'm going this is going to be off stream as well okay don't get me wrong but I'm um, kind of it's an interesting project and I thought it'd be worthwhile just kind of showing you guys how to how to figure it out essentially how to how to how to do this right now this is not meant to be airtight don't worry about that this is essentially just for the steam or whatever coming off like um coming off like the dishes or whatever just to kind of keep them a little bit a little bit you know to keep it warm or whatever while they're bringing it out to the senior residence and everything yes it will be worked in the round don't worry there now i've also had quite an interesting week again as i always do i gotta say i have like i've been having i've been having very interesting weeks lately like just, it's been a thing. It's been a thing, people. All right, uh, just to, just to start off. So here's the actual yarn that I'm using, okay? And Lydia's crochet thread, 100% mercurized cotton. Um, this is not probably, and I've just realized I've gotten condensation on the label, but it's fine. 
Now, for this, it says use a 3.5 millimeter hook. I am actually going down to a 3.25 as I want to do. Yeah, it keeps, keeps bugs and dust out, keeps the food warm when they bring it out, that kind of thing. Um, highly recommended if you have one of these, if you ever decide you want to make mashed potatoes. Works very well. In Ireland, we usually just toss a tea towel or something over the pot. Okay, so to start off with here, right in the center, okay, obviously we were working in the round. I don't sit on my cord. So this is where we're starting, okay? Now I can already see, if I hold it up, all right, and this may be a little bit tricky to see on camera, the round ending and starting is here. There is a line and I can see it right here going across. So this is basically this corner here is where they actually start and stop. Okay. So I know that at the very least I've start working in the round. I need to leave this, this little hole. And then I have four double crochets arranged around the center. So basically that is where we're going to start. And I, I do know from the first one here that, that they chained, let's see, they chained up one, two. Oh, interesting. So they did three here. No, that didn't make any sense. Yeah, okay. So yeah, chain up three, then do three, four, four, four for the 12. Okay, so that's where we're at with that. First round is going to consist of, yeah, the first round is going to consist of 12 double crochets around a single loop, and it's not going to be pulled as tightly as it can be pulled. Now, now here's the thing, all right? If you were starting to work in the round, generally doing magic loop is not going to work if you need to leave that hole in the middle, okay? Shenanigans, all right? I'm telling you that. So I think for this one, in order to start it, I'm going to modify it slightly, and I'm going to start from a chain instead. So this is effectively the other way of doing magic loop. Or Well, I mean, it's not really magic loop. It's just like, it's just another another methodology, as it were. One, two, let's say, I'm going to say four is going to be good. So I start by chain four, okay? Now, the other thing as well is that I'm using, I'm using English throwing style here. I'm not using traditional crochet style. The reason for that, like I've said before, you get a lot more accuracy and stability if you're doing very delicate lace work or if anything that requires a lot of, a lot of kind of, zo you know, zooming in basically. Um, and you're, not, you're working with something that's very, very tiny and requires a lot of fine manipulation. Having this style works better. It just does. And I'm going to fiddle with the camera a little bit. Because yeah. this, this light over here, I don't think gives me enough light. But I have an actual proper light, proper like light over here. But I'm pretty sure if I turned it on, it would make all of this look really weird. So, so yeah, okay. So we're now we're chaining four, all right? And I'm going to back this over and slip stitch it into place here. Through the underside loop, if I can, yeah, here we go. Now, that is a very tiny loop sitting here. And I kind of have to decide whether that's going to be big enough to match the loop at the center here. I think it probably will. This may work out to be a little bit bigger, in fact, than than what they're working with, because in fairness, this looks like, I mean, the yarn is the same thickness. Or actually, yeah, no, actually, it may be a little bit thicker. Okay, well, you know what? We're just going to continue. We're going to see how, we're going to see how it works out. At the very least, I can create one of the same size. I may just be omitting maybe the last couple of rows. Okay, we're going to try something around the same, in, this, in the same thing. This didn't have to be perfect. It didn't have to be exactly the same. Okay, this is the go. This is kind of like the, the you know, the, the target, as it were. We don't have to hit it exactly. We just need to get in the right ballpark, right? Okay, so like I said, we're going to start chain three. And then I'm going to start working the double crochets in. And I think for the sake of it, I'm going to weave in the tail a little bit without dropping the hook. For God's sake, what is wrong with me? So one, two. Now the big question is, is do they have gaps or anything like that? It's essentially, is it a magic straight? Is it like a magic, uh, oh Christ, I can't words today. What's wrong with me? Is it like the granny square start 
or are we just going to forego the gaps and just kind of continue to see what happens? I'll have to just double check again. We're using the existing piece as the pattern in this case, and we just have to kind of puzzle it out from looking at that. So here we go. This is effectively the first thing. And you can see, yeah, okay, here's the difference in actual gauge, all right? This is definitely thicker stuff, all right? That, that is not quite, not quite twice the height of that. Yeah, okay. This, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> We're just, we're just going to have to see it. Maybe I'll have to, maybe I'll work out the pattern using this and then remake it in, in the actual, like going down to the gauge that it's actually supposed to be at. But let's say, let's say right here, right there, how many, how many stitches do we have underneath that? What do I want to guess it is? I'll have to separate them a tiny bit because you see we've got, we have like, five double, no, four double crochet is packed into that little space. So how many chains are stuck into this tiny little corner? Therein lies the question. I am going to, you know, I'm going to guess and I'm going to say, I'm going to say there's two, all right? Because if I was doing something like this, I'd probably use two and not three. I don't want it to point that much. This is meant to be a circle, not, not a square. So let's just say, Two chains, <laughs> name of the wrapper, and then we're going to start working again, and we're going to work in the same vein around the rest of the actual loop, and then see where that takes us. Um, again, this is going to be quite the experiment. Okay, and you can kind of, we we kind of just have to accept at this junction, at this juncture anyway, that we are most likely going to have to go back and redo a bunch of this until we figure out, like, again, kind of get the pattern down a little bit more solidly. Now, if I were sensible. I would be writing this down as I go along. And for the record, I am not. I am winging it. So we are just going to continue in our own happy way and live with the consequences of our terrible decisions. And if it happens that I may just have to work all this shit out a second time, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to accept that. You know, I'll have no one else to blame but myself. Again. All right, this is going to take not too much longer. Now, I'm pretty sure that when I go to the joints between rows, I'm going to have a fair bit of flexibility in how I actually pull it off. It's not really going to matter, I don't think, in any great grand scheme of things. As long as I can, as, as, like, as long as I get to something like the same, the same kind of style of loop. Let's see, hold on, one, two. All right, last set of four double crochets. And then we can take another look. Now, I don't actually know if anyone else here but me is it. Oh, yes, I could watch the stream again. You see, you see, that's, that's thinking with portals and I'm clearly not doing that. <laughs> yeah, rewatch the stream, see if I can figure it out for me yammering on. I've completely buggered up my tension. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Let's, let's try that. Let's do that again. Let's do that again. Somewhat more successfully, perhaps. Now, don't get me wrong, I actually quite like working with Mercurized Cotton. Like, it would definitely be one of my more, my more preferred materials or, or fibres. Like, cotton in basically any form is lots of fun. Mercurized Cotton especially so. It does, however, tend to be a slippy motherfucker and I only use metal hooks. Which means that I invite pain and suffering upon myself in the realm of the crochet. Okay. All right. So see what I mean? It just slides right out. You know, I just, I'm, you know, like I said, terrible fucking decisions. Okay. So this is where we are now, this tiny little piece. And this is going to correspond to the center here. Okay. Now then it's very obvious the actual size difference. All right. And now we got to go back and essentially we're going to be repeating this. We're going to go back around and see if we can get this started to work like a circle. Now, I know I'm coming up here on the edge. Let's see. So we do two and then lock in and then, okay. All right, so I can see already that what we're gonna be doing here is that we're gonna chain two and then we're here 
through the topmost chain of the previous round and we're going to do, and I'm not even going to bother doing, yeah, here we go. So we're doing the usual. Here we are at the center of the end of the round. We are now slip stitch into place. And funnily enough, I think what they've actually done is, have they actually done that reverse stitch? Because there's a thing, it's a way that you can actually start a, Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Where's that? Where's that join? Because you see, you can actually tell. You know, in, imagine, in, in fairness, it actually, do, it does involve like looking at this very, very closely. But you should be able to tell what is attached and what isn't. And I can see here that that final stitch here, there's four double crochets here, but the last one in there is the riser. The thing that lifts it to the next to the top so you can actually start the round. Like here we've got four. There's four. There's four here. And there's that. And we have Oh, I see. Okay. So they're using a slip stitch that doesn't basically they're using a slip stitch that doesn't really look right. And then they're chaining up. Okay. Alright, alright, alright. Okay, this is doable. It's doable. So Mine is not going to look the same as that. I'm going to try and essentially make like, like the way that they did that was like their, like anytime I talk about chaining up. Okay. Now, if you drive trucks, you'll know that chaining up means actually putting chains on your wheels. Not so in crochet. Chaining up means you're actually adding chains. And really all that you're doing is moving the active stitch to a different position. And this is really important when you're starting or ending a row, because right now my active stitch is down at the base, okay, the base of this, top of this row, base of the next row, all right? I need it to not be there. It needs to be, it needs to be a certain number of blocks higher than this. And we have, if we think of each crochet stitch as being a certain number of blocks high, like say a single chain is one block, uh, like a chain is one block, a single crochet would say would be two, a half double crochet, a half double crochet would be three, um, and so on and so forth. It, it, like it varies a little, okay. Um, now it's even not even quite right. Like it, it, it's it's like if you want to, it depends on when you want to do a full stitch or, or not. Like whatever. Okay. Long story short. All right. Uh, if I want to move my stitch to the correct position to actually start the next round, I need to chain three because I need to essentially create a a a pseudo double crochet stitch in order to get it to the right place. So like I need to chain three up. So I get up to here and now I'm essentially pretending that this is, that this is an actual stitch. Now, the thing is, is that you can do a thing called standing stitches, but you can only do that if you're actually, like if you're just, you're essentially just working onto a particular, um, like if, you, if you're not actually, oh God, I don't even know how to explain this very well. If you're not attached already, you can do a standing stitch. Because we are attached, the yarn's coming from a particular place, we don't just move the active stitch, we're moving the yarn as well. Like, you could do a standing stitch and that's something different. But okay, you know what, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, if we're starting this, it looks like we're putting a double crochet into the top of these four, okay? And I've already got one in place here. And I can see from here that they there's their, ch the, their equivalent chain up and then the three in, and they're doing it in, they're doing it in the back loop. Okay. Interesting choice. I don't know if that would be my first choice, but you know what? We're going to follow what they do. We're going to do it in the back loop as well. Now, presumably they're doing it for the, the texture, but where possible, I want to try and replicate the pattern to the best of my ability exactly as they have done it, because obviously this is, you know, their, their thing. <laughs> so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll see what we get out of this. All right. Now, I'm going to go to here. Oh, wait, no, hold on. This is the top, it's the one above that is in the back loop. We're not doing, we're not doing back loop yet. Okay. No worries. No worries. Let's continue, shall we? All right. So there's that. We're going through both front and back loops. And we're only going to need three because essentially one has been already already added with the chain up so that we're going to have the correct number of stitches. Oh, fucking look at this. We're going to have the correct number of stitches, which is the important thing. Now, 
I know I don't know if crochet really gets that you know deep or technical, but it can get pretty weird sometimes, especially if you're dealing with this kind of stuff. Like I can see at the edges here we have four double crochets all placed into the same. Like they're not placed through the the, the chain stitch. They're actually placed like in this gap in the hole here. Sorry if this is like I can't lift up the camera. I don't actually know how. <laughs> not a bag. What channel is this? I I'm doing I'm doing a special request. Uh, a local seniors home gave me a massive amount of mercurized cotton yarn. Okay, uh, basically because they wanted to support my my teaching efforts at the local community center. They saw me on Facebook talking about crochet and, and a few other things and talking about the knitting lessons. They said, look, we've got a load of yarn. Would you like to take it? And I said, absolutely. And the only the only thing they wanted in return by special request was that they wanted more of these. OK, this is an old crochet dish cover. And it's to fit a particular. They found that it fits quite nicely onto a particular size of Ikea dish. And they found that it's very useful for them and they want more of them. So they said, listen, can you make it like all we ask is that could you make us some more? We need them. OK, and I was like, you know what? Absolutely. All day, every day for you guys, because they have given me three garbage bags full of fucking yarn. <laughs> like, I can't. How can you turn that down? What a trade, right? I get to work on a new pattern that I've never really seen before. And they get like some like uh, and they get a little, you know, just extra dish covers. And to be honest, I don't even know where this pattern came from. For all I know, it's something that was made in the 70s, you know. But you know what? Like the housekeeper of the residence was incredibly nice, you know, she just out of the blue offered me the yarn because she knew that I, I teach in the local community center. I teach crochet and she was like, you know what, this, that's that's awesome. We're, you know, we're 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 happy to just get it away. We need we want we have it sitting in our storage unit. We want to get rid of it. We think you, you can make use of it. They're like, absolutely. So I said, sure, no, no bother for you guys. Not a problem. Now, the rest of the yarn that I have, like it, it is for quite fine and I don't know how much good it would be for for beginners. OK, but the the yarn is it's fine enough that I know I will work with it and I would really like to to try it out doing basically doing some some bags with it, you know, especially corner to corner bags. I think like like they gave me some amazing colors like and I'm talking like lovely like rainbow colors and pinks and a few others that are just really exceptionally nice and they're either going to make some really lovely earrings or I will make some some little coin purses out of them I've been on a big kick making coin purses <laughs> believe it or not I'll make more of those or whatever that pattern is like the pattern that I came up with for doing a little coin purses with the with the the the, the with this the in stitch color work I'm calling it at this rate essentially using two different colors in a in in a single in a single double crochet stitch just by transferring out which which yarn is throwing the loop essentially for the next part of the stitch like because you can see like for your average double crochet that I've got here all right the first throw is that okay there's the first then put it through there's a second throw there's a third throw there's a fourth throw and all of those go into actually producing the stitch that you see here okay and if you're good if you know what you're doing you can essentially split the split it so that like you can take any one of those loops loops and make them whatever color you want and uh, you just need to know which which one you're throwing at any given time like just and the thing is that like when I when I was doing the pat the color work pattern is all I really was doing was just changing it so that the last loop the one that stitched the on like the V on top okay that particular line was the one that got changed okay and that means that like any time like the tops of all these stitches like I can make rings and everything like that and it's like it's an, it's a nice effect you know especially when I was doing fan work it got this nice like you know cross hatch kind of whatever which is what I was going for you know but I could do like I was doing that in basic cotton I thought it came out quite nice but I think I may use this cotton and then size the hooks down again and then just really like up the tension and and see what I can and see what I can make out of it I think it's going to look really cool and those little coin purses are just like they're so usable like I didn't even think that I thought oh yeah you know it's like it's it, you know because the cotton's not really really, really they're cotton, there's no way the cotton can be thick can be tight enough the coins will fall out and everything hell no color me shocked the thing just kind of came together and I threw an entire like double handful of of dimes and uh 
you know, uh, you know, five cent piece. In it. But basically a lot of like really small little coins in there. And lo and behold, they all stayed in there. None of them have fallen out yet. <laughs> so, you know, there's a winner. We're, we're doing well. Yeah, I've had a very interesting week. Like, but that, 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 that I think was my highlight. Like the home in particular, the seniors residence that I went to is also a heritage home from, I mean, it's old for Vancouver. You know what I mean? Like it's, a, it's like heritage home in Ireland means something entirely different. Trust me. But it was really awesome to see it because it was like, again, like stepping back into the 1910s and it was all like dark wood paneling and Victorian era, or whatever like that. It was a real aesthetic going to it that I just instantly fell in love with. I thought it was beautiful. Okay. I was like, oh yeah, I'm just anything these guys want. Like you want Victorian lace? I'm going to fucking make you some Victorian lace. You're going to love it. But yeah, like just, they were, they were so nice. <laughs> But yeah, it's just it, like, yeah, I can see them, them wanting something that kind of fits this, like more than just like silicon coverings or something. Okay, so we're at the last row here. This is definitely going to work out very big. I'm going to have to redo the pattern, but I may redo it from my own copy as opposed to, as opposed to this one, because this has worked obviously very tightly. So we're back here. Okay. And if you can see... We have these two rows, which consists of this much here, has translated up to this bit here, which is maybe about twice as wide. So the gauge is roughly, you can even measure it out. So our gauge is roughly twice the width it needs to be. Okay. I will have to reduce this by quite a bit in order to actually nail the, the same gauge as this in order to and then actually do the pattern exactly. So effectively, when I'm done with this, okay, it's going to be like that wide. <laughs> It's going to be like a dish cover from like the biggest casserole dish you've ever seen, as opposed to over there, knocking things off my desk. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, like it's just it's <laughs> it's going to be interesting, you know. Well, I'll I'm we'll see how we get on with it, you know. I may just go like to a certain width and then just kind of cut, like cut it off, maybe about like that far here. And then it'll put it out to here if it's going by twice. And then maybe I'll get a smaller hook. Because, like, no, this is, uh, I don't even know. It's like, it looks like it might almost be the same. But I can't imagine how narrow they went down. It Like, what was the size of the hook that they dropped to? You're talking, like, this is a 3.25. Like, what if I drop it down to, like, a 1 point, like, maybe a 1.75 half again? Is that going to work? Holy crap. Do you have a three-day weekend? Yes, we do. Tomorrow we have off. It is delightful. I can't even remember why. I'm sure people, someone can actually tell me why, but I don't really keep track of such things. I just, like, someone tells me, oh, hey, you know, you're getting a day off, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. All right, so here we go. Do we do increases? I don't think we do. We are chaining up, chaining up one, three, four, five. Ah, no, here we go. We are increasing two, increasing two on those corners. Right. So one, two, three, four, increasing two, increasing two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah. All right, so and then increase to oh, so it's not regular. Oh, lads, we've got a free form artist here. Someone who was just wanging it out, and that is three, three, and then two and two. Ooh, Ooh we got a live one. <laughs> It's a, it's a spicy meatball. We're going to have, we're going to have some problems with this. I'll tell you what. All right. So I know what they were going for. All right. They essentially did an entire round of double crochets and just increased as needed in order to keep it flat. All right. And, and I kind of don't like, I'm, I'm kind of expecting I'm going to have to do something similar and it's just going to be a pain in the box, whatever it is, but you know, it's fine. It's fine. We, we accepted this going in. And this time we are doing through the back loop only. So we'll see how we get on with this. Now I know I'm not doing increases immediately. I'm doing at least four normal double crochets and then increasing. 
Now, I can definitely see how lo much looser this is. I'm, oh, I wonder will I change over. Okay. <laughs> someone's loved, someone's loved one got a little wild. <laughs> they, they just, eh, they, they, they went, they, they were going for something. I'll say that much. Like the normal rule of thumb is like, if you're going to actually decrease, you want to act like six decreases in a, in a square. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're increasing normally, six increases per round is generally all that you need in order to keep it flat. And they've got more than six here, so God only knows what they want. And it could just be a, it could be a function of tension. And I don't know if people realize this, but when your tension is different, then the number of it de the increases does matter in order to keep things flat. It just, it absolutely matters. This though, this could be, oh, this could be interesting. And it kind of changes things if I am not able to pull this together because I can't get the correct, like if I don't have the correct tension, I'm kind of stuffed. See, I'm, no, okay, this isn't going to work. Okay, so here's the problem, all right? Now I'm following this here, all right? So here's the start of the round. I can already see this here myself. I'm not sure if you can see it, but I can definitely see this, okay? Here's the start of the round, all right? The chain up. Now we're starting our double crochets, which is this, uh, this little section of stitches here, which again, I don't think you can see because I have no ability to zoom in on my camera. It's just my fucking iPhone. Now I have, here's the start. Here's a little section of double crochets. Now, when we get as far as here, at this point, then they start doing increases in order to keep, to, to essentially make the round in order to keep it flat. And they obviously got it right, but I can see here that this is not going to work because I've just added one increase and you can see that the angle, like that's the angle of the stitch as it was worked. And that's the angle of, of like the, 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 essentially the, the row underneath the line of the row underneath, underneath. Um, and that angle there is about, it doesn't look like it. And this is more of an experience thing rather than anything else. But this angle here is effectively 90 degrees. And that means that it only requires one, it only requires one increase at this point in order to keep it flat. Because when you want to keep it flat, when you actually make this turn, this turn here, I'm not doing this very, I'm not showing this off very well. Like you always need to like, it's, it, what's going to happen as you start to work stitches in the turn is that the stitches will start to lean backwards, okay? Because there's not enough, there's essentially not enough space because there's, there's the top of the stitch here, okay? If you have the same number of stitches, the top of the stitch essentially is going to start leaning backwards even further and further because like, as you make the turn, there is more space at the top here than there is at the bottom. And it, it's just it kind of just the, the way that the, the way that the actual structure of it works out. And the problem with it, okay, is that, as it leans away, obviously it's going to start, it's going to want to start tightening it up. And that's the thing that actually makes it pull itself upwards and that then it becomes 3D and you start shaping. Now you don't want to do this in this case, you want to keep it flat. And that means that you have to need to essentially take that angle and keep it. If it's, if it starts to lean backwards, if the, as in it starts to grow past 90 degrees, you need to add an increase to pull it back to 90 degrees. Okay. As long as that angle here, that's the top, top of this row. And I know it doesn't look like it, but I'm looking at the tangent, not the actual circle itself. And then I may be getting into algebra and I'm so sorry if this is, if this, if this is triggering flashbacks, I am really sorry. Trigger warning. This is maths. So there's that angle. It's the tangent essentially on the circle. Okay. We want the angle between that and the stitch to be always 90 degrees. And if it is, then we know that we're going to get a circle. If it's more than 90 degrees, then you've gone wrong because then it's going to essentially have too much here and it'll start to go wavy and, and it'll essentially start to, to go wavy and wobbly because it has too much material and how this material is going to pop, it's going to essentially make a ruffle. Okay. And sometimes you, obviously you do want to do that, but that is like, it has the extra material needs to go somewhere and it becomes a ruffle. And if there isn't extra material, if the material is essentially needs to, like there isn't enough of it there, then it'll stretch and it'll start to curve and shape. Okay. 
And I'm not sure if I'm explaining this totally well, but look, that's exactly, this is essentially how increases work when you want to maintain a circle. The problem again, in this case, they've got two increases worked one after the other in order to maintain this, this circle here, the flatness, but because they're coming around this corner, Okay, and this is a sharper corner at this point in their in their when they're working than in the copy that I'm working, and it's because the tension is different. I don't need an increase at the same point that they do, and that's just, that is effectively an embuggerance. That is not fucking going to work, and it means that we're going to have issues later on. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I'm going to do a thing. Um, I'm going to go and get my my crochet hook, my crochet hook set, my personal hook set. I'm going to have to get a smaller hook and attempt to match gauge because I get the feeling that this is not going to work otherwise. I'm going to be chasing my own fucking tail trying to, to, to get this to come together unless I can match the gauge exactly. So I'm going to put my headset down and I'm going to run out to the, my, where my crochet stuff is and grab it and I'll be back. Hang on. I got my crochet hook off the solo pretzel. Let's see if we can make this work. Okay. What have we got? Hmm. Say it's my three point two five. And I don't want to go down to a two point two five. Hmm. I'm pretty sure the one point five is gonna to be too small. So we are gonna try the two. Uh, you know, I don't even think it's going to work at that. It may, it may not work at that. I may just need to just bite the bullet, go down to 1.5 and just say, fuck it and try it with the smallest I've got. Like, yeah. So just so you know, this is a 1.5 millimeter hook. This is teeny tiny hook. And I get the feeling that I'm going to have to use this asshole or else it's not going to work. Because the gauge is so small, like, and this is not to say that I can't, it's just that that gauge is so tiny, I will be in severe danger of splitting the yarn. I'm going to have to just do a quick test, because if I'm 1.5, I might get away, for the, get away with it, but if I, but if I can't, then we are going to be in serious trouble. Like, so there's, there's, here's the thing, okay? By and large, the size of the, like, I don't really think it's actually the size. It is certainly not about the size of the hook at the top. It's also about the size of the actual shaft of the hook here. Yeah. Full disclosure, I did shot a very nice tequila with my dad and haven't had alcohol since May. Good luck. Good luck. Godspeed. Let's see. Is this doable? Yeah, okay. All right, all right, all right. Let's do redo. We'll frog it real fast. We'll redo it and see if we can match gauge. I get the feeling that we're just going to have to... We're going to have to just try it anyway. And I mean, 
The nice thing about cotton, I will say, is that it's incredibly forgiving if you do decide to if you do decide to frog it. If it's markerized, then it's very very forgiving. Not so much. Not so much. I think the uh, the regular cotton and machine cotton is a whole nother beast unto itself. Now I wonder actually, will I also do? So that is four. Now I wonder, should I actually do a smaller? No, you know what? Let's just let's let's let us let us do as I am going to say. Let's just fucking wing it. Perhaps we'll get the right place now. I'm already going to be splitting the air, so this is definitely going to be a. Uh... Oh, this is going to be an experience. Can we be? Is that big enough as the actual center? Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's let's start. Double crochets. Let's start with our chain ups. This is real kind of like getting into lace making, and I will say I do not do it very often because I find it to be incredibly fiddly work. And there is a certain type of person who enjoys the complexity of it, and I don't know if I am that person. Especially, by the way, if I'm using a hook this fucking small, because this is like on the border of I can't see what the entire shit I'm doing because the ye olde hook is too small. Like, seriously. 1.5 millimeter. And it's it's perhaps doable, I think. But if you're doing crochet because you want to, you know, but the whole mindfulness and all this kind of stuff, you know, and like, you know, mental health and et cetera, et cetera. I somehow don't think that this is going to be like the thing that's the thing that helps. I say, ah! <coughs> <coughs> holy shit. <coughs> Blow my nose up. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to try to stay up until, thank you. I'm going to try and stay up until I feel normal. Watch your game. Oh, that's actually cool. What are you playing? I'm curious now. Oh, every time I sneeze, I feel like my entire nose just exploded. Which, if I'm being honest, it kind of it kind of does. All right. Oh, this is the fiddliest shit in the world. And I know that I've gone and left my very small hooks. Like I have an entire selection of very small hooks. Okay. In fact, who am I kidding? I have way too many. Way too many hooks, okay? Not even gonna lie. I, I buy them by the fucking handful because there's something about seeing them in a thrift store. I'm just like, oh, hey, I need more crochet hooks. And I know that it's my brain lying to me. And I know that it's being nuts. But I don't care. I end up getting it anyway. And I make excuses like, oh, you know, I'll use them in teaching and everything like that. I'm absolutely not using a teaching. I'm just weirdly obsessive about crochet hooks. And I'm still hoping that I'll find, like, another like vintage boy hook from like the 1940s or something else equally ridiculous and that does not fucking look right i totally put that in the wrong place <laughs> yeah slay the spire nothing crazy so addictive oh hell to the yes do you like slay the spire all right i'm not even kidding like last year when i was in the middle of like you know um <clears throat> mental mental health breakdown insanity like say the spire was was like it, it it helped you know there was like a solid month and where all i was doing was just like weeks and weeks and weeks and all i was doing was playing slay the spire because everything else felt like it was just too hard or like it was just like it, the, like i just couldn't seem to do anything else i was just like i needed just something to keep my brain from eating itself entirely and i ended up playing the room and the room two and I, before I got on to playing the room three, I was just like, I'm just going to play somewhere else, say the spire. And lo and behold, I was just like, <laughs> for quite a while. All right. I am not doing, I'm doing single crochet. What am I doing? But yeah, no, it's, a, oh my God, it's a fantastic game. Do you realize I've never even gotten to the end and actually slayed the heart of the spire? I've never done that. Like, I just haven't. I suck at it. I really do. I'm terrible terrible at Slay the Spire. I love it. 
I'm just real fucking bad at it. <laughs> it is it is great though. Phenomenal game. Absolutely stellar, stellar, stellar game. Oh, I don't think I've got enough. Yeah, I don't have enough here. This is going to be a very squished first row. And I'm still on... I'm still on slightly... I'm still on slightly too big. How do I... How is this not the same as this? Were these using, like, micro-fucking hooks or something? Because I do not have... I'm going nuts. I'm, I'm going nuts. I don't even... You know, I'm not even sure what to do now. Hold on. Do you know, okay, I'm gonna get all my, oh, fuck this, I'm gonna get all my cotton. You're gonna have to, you guys are gonna have to help me. Look, we're gonna have to pick up some fucking cotton that's gonna actually match this. Hold on. Oh, fuck it. Oh, if anyone cares, that was the sound. If anyone cares, that was the sound of me dropping all of my cotton. Yeah. Okay. All right, you're going to get a bit of a... Hold on. You're going to get a bit of a field trip here. Woo! All right, all right. Look. Here we go. This... I wonder... Because that seems like it's fucking mercurized cotton as well. I don't even know how... How is that not working? Oh, hold on, hold on. Is the casino... A smaller gauge? I don't think it is. Where's that stuff? Sure, are you. Are you the same gauge? I don't know. Let's see. No, I mean, this is fucking tiny. This is literally like teeny tiny. It looks like exactly the same thing. Is that the same gauge or I'm just like... Yes, no wonder I'm trying to give away yarn. I think we've established by now that my, my, my thing with yarn is fucking unhealthy. Yeah, I know. I think the casino might be... The casino might be smaller. I think this yellow stuff... Did, well, maybe it is. It's got some hair on it. I'm not going to talk about that. Mercury's cotton. I don't even know why I'm looking at this. I can't read Danish. It seems a little small. Okay, look, we're going to take out... We'll take out that stuff. And that's the thing. No, it's not the thing I'm actually working on. This is the one that I'm working on. Let's leave that over. And then I'll take out the the casino. I kind of feel like I need to... I kind of feel like I need to get a white one as opposed to something like yellow because white is traditional. All right, stay there. And I don't think there's any other thread. I mean... I have a lot of cotton, but I don't think I specifically have anything thinner than that. I don't think. No. Good quality stuff, but not not so much not so much as super thin. Unless we're talking like actual fucking embroidery floss, and I don't know if I want to go down into that particular fucking hellhole. No, I don't see anything. Alright, fuck it. There we go. Let's leave it over there. There we go. Okay, all right, let's see. Hmm, all right. This is this. And it seems like... It seems like this might be thinner. Not by much, mind you, but what is that? And the casino. This, by the way, is Burnett Casino, and I don't think they make it anymore. Uh, no, this is the same. All right. Well, fuck. I think we're just going to have to try with the, the yellow. 
and see if that works out to be a closer closer fit because I cannot go any lower than the actual like the actual uh, the actual size of the hook is definitely probably the lowest I can go without really just kind of getting into like actual fucking thread and for the record I've done micro crochet I did it once or twice and I thought that okay that's great I've done it I've tried it I'm never doing that shit again let me, let me do the mid-size crochet because micro crochet I think is for people who are literally insane. That or they have better eyesight than I do. Okay, let's see. Put that over there. Put that over there. I mean, presumably Merc bow mold made this cotton because this, you know, but there's no other information. Well, okay. Let's look at bits of other yarn on it. Okay, where are we? Where are we at? Starting over again. We can totally do this. If I can untangle this and not completely shag it up before I even get started. Oh, come on. Here we go. So, if anyone's wondering, my vintage adventures this, this week have been rather rather interesting as they usually are I ended up going all the way out to went all the way out to Coquitlam all right mostly because like I wanted to go to Coquitlam for various reasons I was looking around for some furniture I've managed to acquire an actual like like a vintage china cabinet because I decided that my tiny little apartment two bedroom apartment what it really needed was some giant over the top Victorian furniture and this was not even my first choice, let me not, let me be, be clear. What I really wanted was in a cabinet that's even more outrageous than that. But I decided, you know, that like we're just going to go for the one that costs 50 bucks and not the one that costs $7,000. Because if you really want Victorian cabinetry and you want the nice ones, I'm pretty sure you're going to be spending, spending up. Anyway, got the cabinet for basically one reason only, and that is storage because one of the issues with living in a small two-bedroom apartment is that you're perpetually on the verge of not having enough storage. And I have been long since past that point for several, probably a couple of years at this rate. And I just thought, you know what, would, you know, you know what we could do with more storage? We could just, you know, <laughs> see about getting a large china cabinet. And we can use that for all kinds of stuff. And then see how we you know see how we get on so right now i have a china cabinet that is partially full of kids crafting supplies and partially full of old glass and books i have no actual china in it because that seems too obvious i don't actually collect china myself my grandmother did let me, let me be fair and old china cabinets definitely make me think of her because she had the whole, like, the old curio cabinet, like, straight out of the Victorian era and all that kind of stuff. And it was delightful, I remember the time. But, like, me, myself, not not hugely my aesthetic. Like, I, I liked I liked the furniture, yes. I liked some amount of the old glass. But, like, China, yeah, I could take it or leave it at this point, really. Which, I know, yeah, you know, I don't know. Oh, come on. Just... This is doable, but Christ, it's annoying. I think I might just weave in the ends afterwards, if I can manage it. But this looks a lot more promising. I'll just have to do the first row, and then we'll see if we can figure it out from there. This is incredibly fiddly bullshit. <sighs> That's going to be what it takes. Whole pile of yellow Dutch cotton. And my patience being tested. Let's see. We'll see. No, not yet. So, in my vintage travels while I was going out to Coquitlam, I stopped into what I can only describe as the biggest rummage sale in the world that essentially had been packed up into a shop, probably no bigger than my own apartment. Like, just, just incredible, just, just a very interesting experience being run by an older Chinese lady who had no interest whatsoever in actually following me around or paying attention to me. All she was just like, yeah, here's the stuff. And there's so much of it here that there are literal caverns in between the, like, the, the of, of just things stuffed everywhere, piled up 
like on every shelf on top of each other. There's no like, you know, separation or anything like that. No, you have piles and piles of glassware. So I went through this going like, oh boy, this is going to be fun. I went through it with my black light, picked out anything that glowed green, snagged myself a whole bunch of vintage glass and then just rocked on over her and said, yeah, I want all this. And then we had this long conversation and I explained to her about the manganese flash and about like I'm a a dealer and everything like that. And then, oh, guys, I'm thinking so much about this. She had what she had a particular pattern called Indiana glass pyramid. Okay, now she had the pitcher and three large tumblers, but they were in clear, not in pink, yellow or green. Now, I have seen pink, yellow and green. like pyramid on and off okay you know I've seen it online I've seen it in like in person you know every once in a while I I like it to see it this is super popular for uranium glass I have never seen it in clear and I was looking at it going like crap should I buy this now I ended up not buying it because I realized I couldn't find a single sold comparable anywhere on eBay it's not listed it's not for sale anywhere and I couldn't even find a picture of the actual pictures that like I couldn't find a photo of the pit, the clear picture itself. Okay. Now I do have my Indiana glass book, so it is listed there as yes, they did it in clear, but it must be one of the rarest path. It wouldn't literally must be some of the rarest stuff they've ever done. Cause I can never seen another one like, and I was saying like, she, she was like, Oh, do you want to buy it? Do you want to buy it? And I was like, I don't know if it's a, f- I don't know what to give kind of a price to give you on it. I really don't. It's like, I have no idea what it's worth. All I can tell you is that nothing has been sold in the last like 90 days on eBay <laughs> I don't know and now I keep thinking about it and I think what's probably going to happen is that I'm going to go back and just tell her look I don't know if 10 bucks is a fair price I really don't but I keep thinking about this and I'm going to take it as a sign that like I need to have it okay whether for me or if I sell it I'm not sure yet but it's been weighing on my brain at this rate. It's just like, I keep thinking about that fucking picture and glasses set. It's, yeah. If you guys want to actually just Google it, right? The pyramid pattern is a very classic Art Deco kind of depression glass pattern that was done by Indiana glass, like in the early days. And again, in uranium, whatever like that, it's just, it's like, the, it is absolutely just, it's a hell of a thing to see because it's so desirable. Like people do like it. They pick it up all the time. So yeah, that's your small nugget of weird information for today. I like the look of china cabinets, but you know, desire for china at all. I know, right? It's like, I, I love them. And I think they're useful for a lot of things. But like, do I want to collect china? No, I really. I'm not, I'm not about the teacups. Some people are, in fairness, I will say this much. Some people are all about the, like the, 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 the teacups. And I didn't even realize that that was like a thing. But now apparently they are. Um, I know I follow a guy on, on YouTube, if I remember right, and his entire thing is, is glass, uh, glass teacups because he just likes, he likes things like uranium glass, like a teacup and the saucer or whatever, thing like that. And he's not even interested in the china, but he wants the glass teacups because he thinks they look classy. And I gotta agree with him. They do kind of look really classy. So like, it is definitely like a thing. Just the whole china. (laughs) No, it's not really for me. Coffee cups now. I will absolutely collect glass coffee cups. I don't think I've actually shown it on. I don't think I've actually shown it on stream, but I do have a glass. I have a, a bunch of little little clear glass creamers, and my absolute favorite is I swear to God about six inches tall, and it is not vintage. It is absolutely modern. Okay, it's a reproduction of some famous pattern. I have no idea. I've never been able to identify it. It's grey cut. It's hugely elaborate and it looks very much like early American pattern glass. And I even asked the APGS group, like, hey, does anybody know what this is? Because I'm kind of curious about it. And they were just like, eh, contemporary is not one of ours. I don't think, you know, it's not, it's worthless. And I'm like, oh no, you misunderstand me, kids. I'm not going to feel bad throwing this in the dishwasher and I'm going to use it every fucking day when I have my coffee and it's going to bring me the, like the... The, the greatest amount of pleasure because if it was real early American pattern glass like 100 year old stuff you would not be able to put it in the dishwasher you'd have to just leave it there and like wash it by hand and who's got the time like I even got like a really nice large coffee cup but it's got gold stuff on it and I was like yeah I'm not gonna be able to put this into the dishwasher okay and 
I now realize that this was literally a mistake to buy this because I'm like, I don't use it because I know I can't throw it in the dishwasher. Like, that is where we're at. I just do not have the fucking patience for, like, a dishwasher, <laughs> for not, for, for washing stuff by hand. I have a dishwasher. Yeah. It's probably the same reason I don't really use my vintage Pyrex much. Like, for special occasions, yes. Otherwise, no, those Cinderella bowls stay in the cabinet and they do not get touched. Because, like, I can't put them in the dishwasher and they're a pain in the box to clean. But yeah, that's like, oh, I go. That's the problem. Like, it's like a lot of this old vintage glass. I'm like, I would love to use some of this myself, but I know I never would because I'd be like, I don't want to hurt it. It's fucking 100 years old. I don't want it to be like, I don't want to be the person to kill it. <laughs> I've already managed to break a lot of fucking glass. I'm not even kidding. My mom was a China cabinet, the grandma was a China. Oh, yeah, there you go. Like, I obviously did not get my. <laughs> my grandmother's china. I have no idea what happened to it, you know. Um, all I have from my grandmother is uh, her shawls. I have the shawls that, a pair of shawls that she wore every day when she was leaving the house. Because in her time, a woman was not seen outside with their hair uncovered. So I I have her shawls. They're just these basic cotton, like cotton pattern shawls or something like that. I have no idea even where she got them. They're nothing special, but they're very special to me. And you may also notice as well that I'm not wearing my necklace that I'm frequently seen wearing. And that is because it is once again in for cleaning. <laughs> and I'm afraid nothing can be done about it. I have to wait for it to come back. That particular necklace has been a bit of a bugbear. And I also found out that apparently it's not, um, it's not aquamarine, my birthstone. It's actually blue topaz. And I'm reasonably sure that my godmother... May she rest in peace. Did not know that when she bought it. Because <laughs> she intended it to be my birthstone. But you know, I just... <laughs> I'm sure she wouldn't. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. You know? Because it's the thought that counts. But it, because it's sterling silver and I wear it and never ever take it off. Yeah. I It gets tarnished really easy. So every once in a while, I have to go up to the local jewelers and I pay them $25. And they basically just have to clean it by hand. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's worth it. And, you know, it's just as far as I'm concerned, it's just the cost of owning it. But, yeah. Now, that said, while I was up in Coquitlam today, okay, I wandered into the Value Village, as I am wont to do. And it's not a Value Village I get to very often, all right? But every time I'm up there, it's like, like, the Value Villages are always very interesting because, like, there's always essentially, there's two, there's essentially two components to them, right? They're either really, really good or they suck balls and there is no in between. Like... They're incredibly variable and it's kind of fun, I guess. It depends on if I catch them on the right day, but oh boy, when I was up in Coquitlam, did I ever catch them on the right day? Because, children, I pulled $200 in sterling silver out of a box and bought it for 20 bucks. Hell to the motherfucking yes. Now, the only question is, would you guys like to learn something about sterling silver? Because I can teach you a little bit about it right now because I got my sterling silver. <laughs> tell you a little bit about it I like just the random stuff you pick up when you're an antique sealer it's fantastic when we moved my nana it went to a nursing home I took some of her blankets so she would cover me when I was little oh my god that's adorable I can still remember I go over to my when I went over to my nana's place she had these incredibly scratchy wool blankets that I personally hated okay what I wanted to really do was I wanted to go into the parlor, the front room, okay? The special room with all the knickknacks and curios and we were not allowed in there normally because we were only children and we'd knock things over, right? But in there, she had a white furry rug, okay? And I'm not even kidding. It was like she... Sh it was literally like someone skinned a polar bear and laid it down on the floor. And she had it because it was just like a fashion thing or whatever. And I'm pretty sure it was not real or anything like that. But... We were kids. We had never seen something like this. We thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And we would all we wanted to do was go and lie down in it and play on it and generally make utter fools of ourselves. It, <laughs> and it was just, it's now one of my, my most treasured memories is that my, my grandmother had a fuzzy white polar bear rug in the parlor. <laughs> and <laughs> we were not the, and there was only like a special occasion we were allowed into the parlor and we got to play with it and it was just the silliest thing in the world okay so I'm going to finish this row 
because you can see now um, I'm going to show in a second I'm getting I'm far closer to gauge in this case I may not again I may not be landing exactly on gauge but I will get I will probably get closer than I have with the other with the other yarn and that means that at least we're in kind of the right ballpark of actually nailing the pattern but I'll just finish off these two stitches and the nice thing as well is that this yarn actually works up quite well with this particular crochet hook like and again like this is not perfect don't get me wrong like this is still kind of a little bit tricky to kind of work it up but it will it'll do the job it's not it's not great hang on one two one two three oh wait I've an extra one gotta be careful it's essentially like working like a, like working with a needle it's so fine one two three four okay now and here is our attachment point I'm going to now you can't see a whole lot unfortunately because this stuff is so tiny God only knows how the people who actually stream micro crochet do it they must have a magnifying glass okay so here we are this is the first two rows okay and this corresponds to this section here in the middle and if I actually just line them up my gauge is still off by about half a stitch all right so it's still not it's still not as tight as this like I can see that these double crochets are like the height of the stitch here the double crochet is just a tiny bit bigger which makes me wonder like how we do it like I can definitely pull out the thread if I really just want to take a look at like there and if I take this other thread and lay it across we'll maybe get a comparison of the two yeah so maybe it's not obvious here but that is a little bit thinner yeah Blockworker jams, yes, this is the reason why it's so small. This is like I'm like I'm this is easily some of the smallest crochet I've ever done. Like it's not like not micro crochet, I've done that before, and trust me, if you don't want to do it, it's a pain in the ass because you will strain your eyes doing it. But what we've got here is like this is a vintage piece, and I'm essentially trying to copy the pattern. And this one that I've got here, this vintage yarn is thinner than the thinnest mercurized cotton I've got. So I may need to go down, I may need to essentially find something that'll that'll work like this because the this is this is the center here that I've just done these first two rows and that's like no. okay so I've got a measuring tape right because crochet has free form gauges essentially becomes like entirely indifferent it's like it doesn't make it it kind of does not make a whole lot of a difference like how you do gauge because you essentially just need to do a piece and then kind of eyeball it or measure a certain known section so I have like 28 millimeters across for those first two rows on that section and then what I've just done on this yarn is as there to there is a 31 so there you go so yeah we are looking at like a difference of three millimeters and over the course of like per like per two rows a difference of a millimeter and a half per row okay and that means that like for each of these for each of these rows it will probably let me think uh 28 so 14 millimeters per row and here's 15 so you're talking for a difference maybe you're close to but eh, no it's gonna be a little bit more than 10 no yeah a little bit more than 10 percent so like so like this is probably gonna be a little bit more than that like when I actually finish it, it's gonna be that much bigger ish we can see afterwards and I eyeball it like but yeah this this I may have to it's gonna be closer it's probably the best I'm gonna do for now until I can find some slightly thinner mercurized cotton this is not gonna cut it it's just a little bit too thick I'll have to go and hunt down something like this but a size down again and for the record what we're working at here is super fine and you can go down to lace <sighs> yeah that's probably where I'm gonna have to go fucking great 
crochet stitch tension. Yeah, it's gonna have to be nice. Oh, fun, fun fucking times. Anyway, we'll continue. I inherited some little crochet doilies from Grandma to come to try and repair. I think they ran into moths or something. Oh, harsh. Like, I know moths will eat wool. I don't know if they eat cotton. Maybe they eat organic fibres. I don't know. I do know that moths don't eat acrylic. For what it's worth. Okay, so next row. All right. Now, when I did this first, right, the, the increases turned out to be a complete fucking mess. But, so we're going to have to just kind of see, can we get the increases to work? Oh, sterling silver first. Okay, all right. I'm going to show this to you guys. Okay, we are going to talk a little bit about sterling silver. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, like, the Folly of Value Village. All right. Now, now, if you guys know me, if you guys know me, you know that I am an anti Like, as well as being a, a crochet artist and essentially kind of idiot, um, I am also an antique stealer. Okay, and the antique stealing thing is mostly the day job. I do crochet for fun, right? And I occasionally go into Value Village or thrift stores or, you know, I go basically anywhere and I'll start looking for vintage stuff. And what I find is like stuff I, I like resell it or I know someone will buy it or blah, blah, blah. You know, I'll put stuff up on Etsy, all that kind of thing. Or I'll do private sales. Yeah, it's just fun times indeed. Anyway, I spend a lot of time in thrift stores, right? Everyone's always asking me, it's like, Cypher, how is it you find so much good stuff in thrift stores? And I'm just going to say to them, it's like, you don't understand. I'm in thrift stores constantly. I spend a lot of time there and I spend a lot of time driving all over the greater Vancouver area. Do you want to know how many miles I put on my car in the last week? About 300. <laughs> now, so what we've got here, all right, is essentially a prime example of the fact that Value Village are staffed by people who really do not pay attention, okay? Um, and this is not to say that like Value Village are a bad company. As far as I'm concerned, they're literally a profit. They are a for-profit company that has made a very, that makes a very good living, essentially providing like secondhand goods to the public. All right, not going to knock them for having a niche. Okay, they are absolutely ripping the piss sometimes with their prices, but. I'm just I kind of want to forgive them for that because occasionally we come up with shit like this and I'm just like oh yeah that's why I go there like I don't go there because they're good I go there because like everybody donates to them and that is basically where you find the good stuff okay and a lot of the time they don't know what they've got especially if you're in particular niche interests like what I do okay so I was out at the Valley Village in uh, Coquitlam uh, it is the one just Oh, fucking well, it's just off Barnet Highway or whatever, if you're really curious. Like, and like I've said, Value Village has either, they're either really good or they suck balls and there is no in between. All right. And I pulled these two sets out of a box. They're just about to go up on sale. All right. And the worker had wandered off putting other stuff up and I was looking, I kind of do, you kind of just do a nose around and I spotted these sets and I'm just like, and the brain suddenly goes, whoop, 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 take that shit out. And I normally don't look at silver plate because I think, what's the point, okay? But in this case, like, my my antiques radar starts to go off. And I'm like, well, I guess we're going to be taking a look. So the first thing I did is that I picked up these, all right? These are little pumpkin salt and pepper shakers, okay? They are Mexican. And you can see that they've got these lovely little roses on them. The two are exactly the same. Little roses, a little stem, okay? And if you actually want to refill them, because again, like, there's a little the holes on top, you actually just unscrew the base. And there you go. And you put your salt pepper in there. And the fish, by the way, is very nice. It's very well machined, okay? So, so that's a really great herb. Look, look, just don't listen to my rambling, okay? Just... Pay attention to the information and don't listen to my bullshit. Okay. So these little, the, these little salt and pepper shakers, all right? There's the set that, that comes with it, basically these two. You get the salt and pepper shaker and then you have the little tray that they come in. They all go together. They're very nice. Now, all three of them are marked with the same mark. They're underneath here. And the one that's kind of a little bit easier to see is the one here. And you can just about see the mark here. Now, I have no earthly way of getting the camera to focus on that, so I can just read it out for you off the base of this motherfucker. It says, Sterling, Hecho en Mexico, 925 LJDF. All right. Now, 
Sterling obviously is the old mark. It, the the old mark that says this is sterling silver. 925 is a particular number code that refers to the content of silver in the piece itself, okay? Now, pure silver tarnishes quite easily. So if you actually have something that's 100% silver, it would look kind of a bit crappy because it would constantly tarnish it. So what they do is that they, when they mix sterling silver, they mix 92.5% silver with a small amount of copper. And the, car, the copper doesn't, doesn't tarnish. Or, or the, they mix it essentially with another metal in order to get it to, like, in, to make, it makes it stronger and it makes it so it doesn't tarnish as much. And there's, there's a bunch of other stuff. But anyway, the important thing is, the important thing is, is that if you have something that is marked sterling silver, 92.5% of, of the composition of the metal that goes into this will be actual silver. Okay? It's the same reason why you've got something like 18 karat gold. It's a measure of, like, how much actual gold is in it. All right? Now, when this one says LJ, that's a mention, that it's a, a mention of the manufacturer. That is not identified in the actual hallmark lists, okay? And if you actually deal a lot in sterling silver, you'll find that there are hallmark lists for almost every country in the world for what is, like, what is considered sterling silver or what's the mark of sterling silver. Because, okay, a little bit of history for you, right? Like, back in ye olde medieval times, all right, essentially people were tired of getting ripped off with shitty metal, which was pretending to be silver, which was essentially not. So... The English came up with the with the hallmark system, and essentially they had an SA office in almost every major town, and with a particular kind of stamp or whatever that they would place onto silver items. Okay, and what that meant is that like you have a silversmith that wanted to essentially have an assurance that yes, this is actually the real thing. Okay, so they would go to the SA office, they would pay their their fees or whatever like that, and if the SA office is an official government thing, and then they would. Uh, they, you know, stamp it with the hallmark. And the hallmark is the, the official kind of designation that says, yes, this is real silver, right? Now, I don't know if there are that many fake hallmarks. Usually it's fairly obvious, all right? But there are lists that you can look up for almost every country of what their particular assay offices like or like cuz i think basically every country started copying what the english were doing in the the 18th century english silver was considered to be the finest in the world simply because they were the guys who made put a lot of effort into making sure that all of their silver was legit okay so and even still like english silver if you if you actually go looking for it generally considered to be some of the best you can get okay especially the antique stuff is in quite high demand but anyway there is a list that you can look at you can Google it online and it will tell you a little bit about the hallmarks for any particular country. And I did look this up and we do have LJ is, a men, is essentially a reference to the manufacturer of these little, this little salt and pepper shaker. And DF refers to uh, dis, District uh, Federale and it's, some, it's, it's, um, it's in Spanish. Okay. Because again, I don't speak Spanish. It's essentially, a, it's a, um, it's a reference to like the SA office itself, as far as I know. Um, the really important thing is that it says Sancho in Mexico and it says sterling in 925. And that means that, yes, sterling silver, the real deal. Okay. Now, these two, these little guys, that's not, they're not very heavy. And in sterling silver, the weight is everything. So I think there's probably about 40 grams of silver. Okay. So, or well, no, maybe a little bit more. Let's say 60. So, I mean, like the scrap value of the silver is like the, yeah, the federal district or whatever. So the scrap value of the silver is the kind of thing that makes uh, like the, the most kind of like, that's the absolute baseline. This is how much this thing is worth. Okay. And that's like, what's the current price of silver? And I looked it up at the moment, a gram of silver is trading for 0.78 Canadian dollars. Okay. So you could do the math, like 60 grams of silver is like what, 40 something dollars. Okay. Again, I bought this for eight because they looked at this and decided that because it was tarnished, and they didn't look at the base or something. I don't know. Maybe they just turned it over and looked at that. Didn't see the actual mark over the end. And said, oh, it's silver plate. And priced it as such. Because $8 is kind of what they would price a silver plate item like this for. Okay. Again, Valley Village, not observant. All right. But that was one. And I was like, fucking hell yeah. But then I saw the cup. All right. And I saw the cup and I thought, what are the fucking chances that this is also sterling? And I had to check. So here's the cup. We'll get to the cup. This, this plate, okay, it has a mark on it that's clearly used with the cup. The two actually don't go together, all right? They are not a set. They are just were used together at, at some point because this has a mark that matches the base of the cup, okay? What this actually is, all right? And again, I have no idea why they missed this, all right? 
This is a sterling silver plate and it is marked down at the base and it says Elbrose Sterling and it has the little eagle head marker, right? And this is another case is that you can go and look up these marks, right? You can look up the hallmarks. Sterling is the old word that is often seen prior to 1900 on sterling silver, okay? It shows up quite a bit. Um, it can be show up after that, but like it, it especially in certain countries or like that. But a lot of the time it can be like, I've seen it on a bunch of stuff and it's usually early 20th century or earlier, right? And then the kind of like after that day, everyone started using the 925 mark, I think, because it was easier, all right? And that kind of thing. So this is this is earlier, all right? And I did actually take a look. Lip, Lipman Brothers is like a kind of, it, it is a Canadian firm. They're known for doing very nice, high quality nut dishes, in silver you can look these up on ebay right a set of four of these was currently on it's currently on sale for ebay i think for about 150 dollars again this is quite you know it's heavy it's not like it's it's not a lot of silver but like that's that's chunky okay now i got the two of these as a set but this is the important thing because this is the heaviest silver piece that i got all right now i shined it up a little bit all right and i'm pretty sure what happened in this case is that these were it was very tarnished all right what happened was the worker in Valley Village picks this up, sees his tarnish, turns it over and sees no mark. OK, you can see there. No mark in the base. All right. And normally if they see that, they're like, oh, silver plate. And at that point, the price tag twelve ninety nine goes on this and this and they go, yep, there you go. Silver plate, throw it out. However. Because they got to be you've got to check your shit, you got to know your shit. What they did not see these marks here okay and i knew to look at the side of the dish the side of if you look at the side of a cup especially the english cups you've got to look at the side of them don't look at the base look at the sides the sides are where the marks are this friends if you can see it this is an english this is an english set of hallmarks all right and not only that, because the, the, the hallmarks, okay, first of all, that stamp identifies the manufacturer. Then it identifies the town of the assay office where it was done. That is the mark of the queen, sterling silver. And then the last mark is the date that this was made and then stamped, okay? And if you know sterling silver, you can actually read this. You can read it as if it was, if it, like, you can read it as if it was, like, writing. It tells you exactly what you need to know. So, first of all, the, the stamp here... The, the lion regent, the lion rampant, that says this is actual sterling silver, 925. And that is essentially the assurance of the Queen of England to say that it is the real deal. Okay, standard thing. The next one, this little anchor, is Birmingham. That is the SA mark for the Birmingham office, which means that this little cup was taken to Birmingham, somebody paid their fees, like a silversmith or whatever, and says, here you go, here's my cup, you can test it, this is the real thing. Uh, you know, stamp it with stamp it with the mark to say that it's real. Okay, someone did that. All right. Now the C here, that is the year, the year mark, and that is 1927. Again, there are lists of these marks. You can go and look them up. They're all just like if all of that information is up online. If you spot these marks, you can just go look it all up. <laughs> now the last one here, the little shield. OK, now there's a list again, obviously, for most of the major manufacturers in Birmingham as well. Like, and again, English silver making or silversmithing has gone back for centuries. They have very good records of a lot of this thing. So that there is the mark for the Barker Brothers. And they were a silversmith firm in Birmingham. OK, now the last thing about this cup, which is probably the most precious thing. OK, this is a christening cup and it's a thing in England and Ireland. I'm not sure if it's such a major thing here. Um, when when a baby is christened, they give you the silver cup, okay? And the silver cup is like it's keepsake, it's a memento, and it's supposed to remember. It represents things like richness and good health and a bunch of other things, all right? It's a, a, like a special gift given to a child when they are christened, when they are named, okay? In the the Irish Catholic culture, and and I'm um, assuming in the Protestants as well. But what it's got here, it says you just about making out. It says to Donald, and then we have the date eighteenth of June. 1930 this lovely script okay and the last part here it says from his godmother all right so this little cup is a christening cup and it once belongs to someone called donald 
and it was a gift from his godmother when he was when he was born all right in 1930 and that's lovely because again we know from the actual we know from the actual hallmark that it was actually stamped in 1927 okay so two three years later you know when the time actually came for it to be sold okay someone they had it specially engraved to their godson and give it to them as present of the when they were christened there you go and it's beautiful by the way it's in very it's in, I like i cleaned up some of the tarnish you can see that it's obviously still got a lot of marks you know when i'm not even sure if it would want a lot of like if, if someone would really want a lot of like changes to it i think people like collectors may like enjoy the actual you know the the like the, 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 the signs of wear i mean when i picked it up and i saw the script and the date i was like yes this is definitely old i'm absolutely going to buy this so what i think is that it was this is like a present because the Lippmann brothers were early 20th century as well, okay? And it's possible that this actually was imported from England in order to make it, or maybe, like, it's, it's entirely possible that, like, this Donald's godmother was English and literally just brought it over to Canada. But somehow it made it way to, its way to a thrift store in Vancouver, BC. And I would not be surprised if this, the guy, Donald, that, like, if he was born in 1930, um... He's probably, he's probably 90 and probably just died. And a lot of stuff got donated to a thrift store, which is, there you go. Little relic from his childhood, his babyhood. Yeah, it is. It's just, it's a, it's a precious little thing. Now, the thing as well is like, I went and weighed all of the silver that I got. There is 246 grams of silver, right? Current price, that's almost $200. Canadian dollars, right? That is why you should, you should know a little bit about this. You know, because it is almost impossible to tell the difference between silver plate and actual sterling silver unless you know these marks. All right. I mean, Value Village absolutely missed that. They looked at the base, saw no, no stamp, no nothing. Because usually if you're silver, if there's, if it is silver plate or sterling, whatever like that, they will, they will often put it on the base, except, except when they're old and they put it on the side and they missed it entirely. And they did the same thing with this set. They turned it over. They saw this said, oh, there's no hallmark. It must be silver plate missed the hallmark at the side and that is how I pulled this for nothing <laughs> yeah that's kind of sweet yeah it is my dad's name is Donald well I'm pretty if your dad is still alive I'm pretty sure this is not his <laughs> but yeah that is that is your 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 sterling silver lesson for today um apparently sterling silver like the price of whatever sterling silver and gold has been going up recently the same as the same for copper you know, so if you do actually find it in a thrift store, consider stockpiling it or something. I have no idea. I'm not into old metal. I will probably be selling these. Like what I'm going to what I'm actually doing with with the two of them, I say I may I may consider leaving the cup as is. But for the other pieces, and especially these guys, I'm going to make sure that they they go through a dip or something to remove all of the tarnish. Like I my jewelry cleaning fluid I don't have enough to actually clean them I don't can't really do bigger pieces so I may be taking these to a jeweler and once again asking them hey $25 just please clean them all up for me <laughs> you know um like yeah you do need something to take the tarnish off and I do have silver cleaning cloths that are absolutely not up to this just I, I scrubbed really hard and managed to get a little bit off the side of the cup and that's about it but yeah there you go. That is your that is your silver lesson for the day. That's not even the only. That's not even like the coolest thing I got. I've gotten a few other kind of interesting bits and pieces today because I was actually out of a vintage fair. I got even more stuff. I'm running out of bubbly. God damn it! There's nothing left. <sighs> okay, do some more of this. Yeah, vintage vintage is like being an antique dealer is an interesting experience because you're constantly like. You're constantly having to stuff more and more random information into your brain and everyone just kind of gets suddenly really confused like it's like oh you really know this stuff and i'm like well yeah <laughs> yes i do i do know this stuff is that i hope that's not i hope that's not amazingly surprising that like i i know how to do my job or the job that i've chosen i got that a little bit today i went over to a very nice vintage fair okay i was actually trying to get a table out and it, lo and behold i could not get a table out not hugely happy about that so i go over to this vintage fair okay it's five dollars to get in i thought yeah sounds good let's do it and 
while I was in there, I had the blast of a time. I went and talked to everyone and I was like, I had my black light with me and I was just looking at glass and talking about glass and generally, generally making an absolute fool of myself because that is just how I roll when I am left alone. And and it was great. And, and all the time people were just like, oh, you're very serious about last. Like, you know so much about last. And I'm like, yes, yes, I am. I don't know how to tell how many way, different ways I can say that I'm an obsessive about antique glass. And I really have an unhealthy fascination with glass. And I spend a lot of time researching about glass. <laughs> like, how do you... How do you, how do you just, like, how do you just say that? How do you, like, oh yeah, like I do, I, I, yes, I do this. Yes. So many different ways. But yeah. And it was really nice to see like all these people and they, like all of these like vintage resellers and they all like have their, they have their niche, but they're, they're mostly their, their niche is an aesthetic, you know, but, like they're looking for, um, they're, they're looking for, oh, like I, I they want, they want kind of cottage core. They want like the seventies or they're all about like old like Scandinavian amber kind of style stuff and and I got to tell them it's like yeah I'm just I'm into glass and they're just like what I said well what kind of glass is like no 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 all glass just anything from the mid 19th century to the present day is all I do that is like my my thing my jam my 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 only kind of thing that I do and like and and they were just like oh that's really great do you like and I was just like oh hey do you want to know something about your glass and I'm just and they and they're just like Buh. and they're like oh yeah it's really hard to 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 research and I'm like no shit it's hard to research how do you think how do you think I get through this <laughs> I learned a lot of stuff anyway so I got to tell people a whole bunch of stuff about their glass which is great fun because there's like vintage resellers are always kind of interested in in their stuff because more knowledge kind of helps them to sell things you know like it's really useful to just like for them to say it's like oh here you go it's a vase it's kind of pretty all right but but it's something else entirely to look at it and say well this is a vase and it's kind of pretty oh by the way it was made in the 1930s by a European manufacturer and blah 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 and it's like and you can just kind of go on with that or even be being able to say well that's what that actually is you know it's not just some random thing it's like that's that's what it was like here's the actual f- purpose of this this thing like the really oh here we go so the really nice thing right was that I was talking to a lady at one booth and I was like I would like that vase there and she was and I was like how much she's like oh two bucks and I'm like are you sure you want to sell me that for two bucks and she was like yeah I don't want it like she was just getting rid of stuff and I'm like well hang on now and she gave me this for free because I couldn't find change and all I had was a 50 all right and she said, oh, it's okay. Look, take it. Like, it's just like a vase. I didn't think it was any special. And I was just like, oh, hold on, Rick. So this, if you've never seen one before, is a celery vase, right? Now, celery vases are like one of the funniest things about, funniest things about the Victorians, okay? So here's a little bit, here's a little bit of a, like a little, little bit of history kind of thing for you. Like back in the late 19th century, early 20th century, celery was like this new hot thing. It was like, it was like a fad, you know, like beanie babies. And everybody wanted to like, wanted to have it, right? And just, and grow it, you know, and, and it was, it was literally like, if you were, if you can imagine rich people eating golden crusted steaks, it was a bit like that, all right? It was the new hotness, okay? So what they had was that like, once everyone started growing celery and they wanted to like, oh, they wanted essentially to show off because that's what rich people do. They, sh- they flex on other rich people. Anyway, so what they do is that like, they would have like, essentially like servings of celery in, you know, in water or whatever to keep it moist or whatever like that. And they would just have it like around the place like in the sideboard to kind of like, here's here, your guests will come in and they have a snack and they can have celery sticks. The same way that like basic white bitches would, run around, would do that today. So it's like, oh, here, eat some celery sticks, you know, instead of having a proper lunch. No, that, that was like the Victorian snack. Like if you wanted to, if you were rich and wanted to flex, you would just like, here you go, celery. Now, I cannot describe how much I do not like the taste of celery, so I have no idea how successful this was, all right? But long story short, the dinnerware sets came out with these celery vases and celery trays, but it was mostly celery vases, all right? So there's overlap, well, I mean, you could get both, all right? This one is an actual celery vase. And they always had a certain, like, height and they have this kind of ruffled top or whatever like that and they usually have this particular shape as well and there's such the like I saw this okay I saw this and I was like that's a celery vase that's early 20th century at the very least possibly late 19th century and I was like I want that 
especially when I picked it up and I was like, and I did the thing where I checked, essentially ran your, you run your hands all over it. You're looking for chips or scratches or any kind of imperfections and you'll catch that using your hands more than anything else. Like, and I, and I, and I even said to her, I was like, listen, are you sure you want to just sell me this for two bucks or even give it to me? Because this is like an actual special piece of glass. And she was like, oh, I have no idea what it is. I'm like, let me demonstrate. So I have Yoli black light. For anyone who cares, this is a Conway S2 Plus. It is a 395 nanometer long UV wavelength torch. Do not hold this thing up to your hand. You will give yourself a sunburn. However, super, super useful if you're in a thrift store because it's a very powerful torch. As well as that, it doesn't reflect a lot of visible light. As in, mostly what you get out of this, I know it seems very bright here. It's a very blue. But that color, that color is like... That is mostly like it's mostly ultraviolet light. It doesn't have a lot of bleed into like visible light spectrums, which means it's a little bit easier to use in thrift stores and it produces a stronger response. Now, if we set this sucker down here, and it's a bit weird to see this, but you can see the way the glass lights up. All right. Now, on the camera, I can see that this is really, that this is really kind of a bit blue. You're going to have to just trust me that actually on screen, it is a limey kind of a green color. Just that the camera here is not is not great at color fidelity, okay? Do not ask me how to change that shit. I have no idea how. You're just going to have to take my word for it. This turns out lime green, okay? So I basically did this, right? Hold on, hold on my black light. And I was like, here, look at this. And I held it up to her. And I was like, look, clear glass. Boom, green. And she was like, what? And she was like, is it uranium? And I was like, because everyone assumes that you're looking for a uranium glass because you have a black light. It's like, no, 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 listen, I use this and it tells me something about the composition of the glass. It doesn't have to be uranium. You just got to know what you're looking at. So I explained about the manganese flash and then explained about celery vases, about what it was. And I was like, it's early 20th century. It's possibly older than that. You're still sure you want to give it to me for two bucks? She was like, absolutely. That's incredible. <laughs> so, yeah, I had a long conversation with her. She's, I'm going to absolutely pay back that favor because like this is a very nice celery vase anyway did the research on it this is a particular pattern it's called it's by imperial glass and it is called uh the uh it's called Am amelia i think is the pattern and it has like some nicknames or whatever but or the shield medallion like the broken medallion or something like that because of this chunk in the middle anyway it's from 1920 so it's a little bit after the uh, P the early american pattern glasses uh, like uh like time frame it usually only goes to about the 1910s at most okay but it's definitely early 20th century and this is essentially be the very end of the era where like celery vases and the victorian aesthetic were really a thing when you start getting into the 1920s and then into the great depression and all that it like tastes definitely changed and got away from the like the very kind of the, the gaudiness of the victorian era and the whole kind of like flexing on using celery vases like celery essentially fell out of favor and became not the new hotness so the celery vases were not made as part of dinnerware sets anymore so end of an era still very nice lovely condition okay so that is probably going to go up on etsy at some point i've already sent photos and measurements to the the early american pattern glass society for their approval they will maybe add it to the database as a reference point for something essentially that's not eapg but it looks a lot like it because it is of a similar era even if it wasn't made in the same time frame anyway <laughs> ants on a log and blow the freaking mind. <laughs> maybe all right okay let's see where we are two increases one two three four five six okay yeah, I can see where they're going with this. They're kind of forming the square. Sudden gear change. Forming the square. And then they're still they're they're still trying to keep it flat. And not especially doing a great job, but you know what? We're gonna continue. It'll be fine. I'll see if I can make up space somehow and kind of eyeball the gauge again. Now, like I mean the, the actual fair itself was lovely. Like, I got another swung glass vase, which will not be going up for sale on eBay, because if I get any swung glass for a good price, I generally offer it to Snow Peep first. Uh, I know that she's trying to, to build her, like, her rainbow, <laughs> the swung glass rainbow. And I kind of, like, 
I know that she wants them and I doubt that she's going to get a decent price for a lot of them because they are so popular. And I saw some incredibly, incredibly nice pieces of glass. There was an L.E. Smith Amberina swung glass vase that it was there for, I believe, 65. And I decided not to get it because like it was huge and I have major fears about shipping a vase that big. Like the other one that I did was just like the one that I did before was just like I like I still had major fears of doing it because I was like, this is fucking ridiculous. This vase is too way, way, way too big. Um, And I don't know if I want to do that again. Like, I again, I, I don't know if I want to spend that much on a vase that size and then have to live with the, the cost of shipping it. Like, oh, God, I'd die. I really would. It was stressful enough the first time. OK, this one, too. And then one, two. This is really interesting. They do an increase and then two and another increase. And I'm, I can see where they're going with it, but I don't know that. Yeah, two and an increase. OK, well, whatever. I guess we're going to continue. They were definitely freehanding this in some way. Which, you know, I can't fault them for. They did a really reasonably good job, I think. Yeah, see. One two and then an increase celery peanut butter and dried grapes i could take over the victorian people <laughs> with a child snack yeah <laughs> yeah right i just uh look i have had an interesting time dicking around on craigslist in the last week because when i was trying to find the china cabinet i kept looking around for like like the what i considered would be like the china cabinet aesthetic you know i wanted like something that my grandmother would have liked okay and I want, I don't go very much for tchotchkes, but I do have stuff that I like, I like, and it brings me joy, and it's mostly my glass, and I don't really have it on display, or at least I have it hidden away, because it's delicate, you know? I thought, you know what, I'm going to just get myself a china cabinet and call it good. So I did, I got a china cabinet, but I got it, like, from Craigslist, and all I was doing was just, like, good, uh, all I was doing was just, like, I set up an alert for, like, china cabinet and hutch and a few other things. And to run for, like, just, you know, notify me when there's new results. And it does actually work pretty well. And finally, I saw some guy who was selling an oak china cabinet for, like, 50 bucks. And I'm like, there you go. Comes apart, comes in two parts. It's at least transportable. It's not going to be, like, very easy to move, but at least it's movable. That'll do. And, they end, and it kind of, like, a light and everything on the inside, if you're into that kind of thing. Personally, I'm not. Um... But I believe my darling husband is already making plans to put LED lights of some description in there and more power to him as long as it doesn't look too weird. I think that he's going to like we have like Google controlled lights for what it's worth. Like we do the Google and just uh, <laughs> tell the lights to go on and off and stuff. But I don't know if I want to do that for the actual cabinet. Like the, the, the light fixture that was in there looked very very old and we ended up unscrewing it and taking it out and the actual electrics look to be really really shockingly shit and rather than risk getting electrocuted by something that maybe possibly was wired together in the 50s i think we're just going to be rewiring it for, with some safe like socket from ikea or something i don't know either way it's not going to be old and we'll see how we get on with that i think see one two three is that okay? Increase. I'm not sure if they are consistent with these increases. Like I can see the curling that's happening there, and I wonder is that a tension thing or is that a me thing? Or is this going to work in blocking? I'm not entirely sure. I think maybe blocking is the kind of thing that would get a good because it does kind of. You can see here that I've got this. It, like uh, the pattern is kind like this at least part in here at least makes sense and i wonder will i get away with the size and i'm just gonna um yeah you know who knows yeah you know i don't know who knows we'll make it work we'll make it work somehow it'll be fine <laughs> i also ordered a person to work on my life yeah right it's it's incredibly silly but <sighs> look my husband likes it, so leave him off. Okay, where are we at? So I got that one, then one, two, and another one. Okay. They definitely did the increases incredibly weirdly. Strange. Like, 
it says one, one, two, and then, but I mean, that's going to leave a stitch of sloping, and I don't think that's a good kind of look for it. Like, you can see even here, there's a slight bend happening from, from my copy of this pattern, which I don't think is great. But like, eh, well, what do you do? It's kind of like, oh, it's just going to block out eventually. Let's just keep going and see how that works. But there's definitely not enough increases, I think, here. And I'm wondering, were they doing a setup of some kind for a later part of the pattern? Two. Like, I can see all this. They did several here with three in between. They only did two in between here. They did four over there. Like, this looks just incredibly inconsistent. Like, there's two. There's two. And then they just start working. And I'm pretty sure that this is not going to, like, this at least is not going to work. But, like, the problem is that I should at least try and get the same number of stitches because I may just screw it up otherwise. I need to be able to follow what they did. All right, let's go like this for a bit. I'm going to add a small number, let's say four, double crochet, back loop. And then we'll see where we're at. Okay, there's the increase, one, two, three. I now have three stitches to work with or three stitches I should say to figure out whether this is going to be successful or not and when we get up here she kind of like they kind of just go nuts and it's like one two three and then they they add a bunch of increases right here to kind of fill it out like I have three left and they have three increases here in the corner to make it go that's insane I mean, well, I mean, no, it's not insane. It's like, it's essentially what you do in order to get the circle to work. But like, they could have spread the increases out across like the rest of the row. And I wonder, is this going to make it like uneven or something? Because I can see there is a slight, there is a slight unevenness, but because we're working at such small scale, it doesn't matter as much as you might think. So, yeah. I guess we're just going to continue and let's see how we get on. Yeah, one, two, and then one in there, okay. Um, two, and it goes to the, yeah. Oh, come on. Work with me. Yeah. One, two, all right, and here. You'll have to count the stitches and see what happens. I still may not get it right, but you know what? The important thing is that we tried. Okay, same thing again. Go through, lock it in. Okay, so that's where we're at now. And I can see that curve. It is not, that curve does not make me happy. We're going to just see if it stretches. Hopefully it does. And there we are. I love it because I live alone, so I've set the lights come on before I walk in so I don't have to go up to a dark apartment. Yeah, there you go. This is the power of modern technology, not even kidding. Okay, so here we go. Now, grand. Now we're up here. And this is going to be interesting because I can see the next row, which is this band here, the one that looks kind of knobbly. All right. Now I can see that what they did, I don't want to assume it's a she, you could very easily be a man, but like if we get up here, what they're doing is skipping, skipping one and doing... And, and doing three in the same stitch. I'm gonna, sh I, like, I can see how this works. I'm gonna just show you guys how. It looks like a fried egg. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fried egg. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it does look like a fried egg. Hopefully, it'll not turn out like a fried egg because we're kind of buggering it up, but we'll see. Okay. So here we go. We have to put this, and I can see that they place that in the, like, this is now the center chunk here. So what they do is that they essentially go back into the same stitch and I think I need to go down a little bit in order to lock it in, but like, it's fine. We'll make it work. And this is now, this is now two, two double crochets in the same stitch. Okay. Then they skip one and they do three in the next no and they're not doing they're not doing back loop 
So skip skip one stitch, three in the next, in order to give it the bobbliness. And I believe this is a repeating pattern all the way around. So I'm going to work it up real fast, and we'll see if we get the same. Essentially, we'll see if we get we get it right. <laughs> all right, Angie, good luck. Oh yeah, I know I'm going to need it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do appreciate it. Good night. All right, all right. Let's let's get this done. All right. So same thing here. Skip one stitch, three in the next. And I think we're assuming at this point that the increases are the things that, that's going to give it enough enough kind of stretch or whatever in order to, to fill to fill a circle correctly with the correct number of increases. And I don't know if that's the case. Because the interesting thing about this is that because we're skipping one and doing three in the next, you might think that there's an increase of three, but we're not. So let's just say we take, we're essentially adding, adding three stitches for every two in the row below. And, and I don't think that's what they, no, hold on. No, I don't think they do it because that was on top. Oh, do they go in under? Because it's not three, it's not a cluster. This is actually done. How in the shit did they? Okay. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is a weird one. We're going to have to back the bus up a second. I got to... Because I'm doing the threes here and it's not producing the same pattern and I'm wondering why that is. And I think it's because it's a function of how they placed these here. What I think they did is that that's that one. Then so that was a, f that's the first. Oh, hold on. It's a two and then, okay. Okay. No. Okay. We're doing, we're doing it wrong. We're, we're slightly cocking it up. What we're, what this is, is like, this is essentially like a, yeah, this is, this is an interesting one. I got like, I'm try. I don't know if I'm going to be able to explain this one actually straight off the bat. Like there is, this one is, this one's tricky to, to explain. I'm just going to say, uh, I can see the stitches and what they're actually doing, but this is just like, like, like I've got to, like, here's a double crochet here. All right. And then I'm essentially increasing, but not really because I'm bringing this over here, creating the next one, skipping one stitch in between. And then putting two together, and this is uh, all right. That's the first stage. So we're essentially creating like a zigzag, but this is effectively a zigzag pattern. All right. Now the next thing that we do is in the center. Okay. At least that's what it looks like. There's one. There's one in the center here, and that essentially serves as the extra stitch. And then when we're doing the last part of the cluster of three, when we, when we do this one, we end up going in under this stitch, the one that we like, we go through the, the, through the wraps of the stitch between. So essentially it looks like this, we're going back through that. And I got to see whether this is actually goes around the base of that or does it still go through or what? Like, maybe is that, because this is not the case of going backwards. The stitches have to be done in order, right? That's that's kind of the thing that kind of is a bit anti-intuitive or whatever like that. If you're looking at this, if you're looking at this cluster of three, if I spread it out and try to make sense of it. If I spread out these little clusters here, okay? Like these, these little, these little bits here. And you can see that there is three here. There's three pieces just, just in there in my hook. I am not doing a great job in showing this on camera. 
Okay, there we go. So there's the three double crochets, right? And the interesting thing about this is that, like, I can see that these these double crochets here, you can see the V that's formed there. They're essentially on the, they're joined at the top, and that means that those are crocheted together, okay? There's one in between them, but the final loop, those are two, those two are crocheted together. And that starts this stitch, all right? So that one, these two are crocheted together, and that's the end of that's that, that first double crochet. This second one is done around it in some way. And then the third one, the one that actually goes into making the, the, the two together of the neck, it basically makes this leg and then makes the next leg over here, they're crocheted together at the top. That one goes through or around, it goes through the center one somehow, such as the, the, the one in the center keeps going, goes around it and then it kind of bobbles up and it creates a pattern. And I can see it, but I have no idea. Oh, wait, no, hold on. Is that front post only or front? Sometimes I can tell from the back. No, I can see the two. They're definitely slapped in there. Where is that? Where are you? I'm going to pull that off a second. Ah, okay. All right, listen, guys. I I need a well, I need a theory craft this a really hard. Some of this is very tricky. Um, part of the problem with actually like trying these old patterns or trying to figure out like what is going on with them, is that you you essentially have to kind of try to start intuit about like well, what was the actual, what was the maker thinking for a start, um, because I'm pretty sure that like whoever was thinking this was like no, nah, they weren't thinking about it. They were just doing free form. Not that I can blame them. You know, if you're making a thing for a particular size or whatever like that, and you're not like planning to make a pattern out of it, you generally don't think too far ahead about what actually, what something is. You just go ahead and do it, right? It would make no sense otherwise. Like if I'm making a bag or something like that and prototyping and I just want to experiment, no, I'm not going to write that stuff down. <laughs> I'm not going to be thinking too hard about it. I'll go back and think hard about it later if I need to actually, yeah, they just need it and made it. A lot of crocheters like that. If they need it, they make it. And then, oh, if I need another one, I'll just make another one <laughs> and don't really think about like well what if someone else needs to make one no you don't think about that I'll just make another one yeah but we'll see what I can do with that stuff I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to just find like I mean, this might be the right, the right thickness of cotton but we'll see how we get on with it but I will have to give some I'll have to do some dissecting I think I need to one good way to actually figure out how to put this stuff together is to literally just rip it apart but I don't want to do that I want this one to be preserved I can't just tear it to pieces so yeah, I gotta have a think about that. All right, if you put this, I have no idea. I'll do something with that. Uh, okay, we may do some raiding. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Will I go annoy Snow Peep again? If she is on, I don't know. Oh, she's on. She's doing patches. Okay. All right. I want to go and t I want to go talk to her about the, the, the vase anyway. I want to tell her about it and just generally make a nuisance of myself. All right, let's go raid. Ready, ready, ready. Uh, I cannot do. Does that work? No, just does that? No. Ah! Okay. Slash raid snow peep. Is that yeah, have a good yeah, no worries. Have a good week, KK. I'll probably see you online at some point. Let's see if I can get this going. There we go. Alright, let's go say hi. You guys have a good time, good week, or whatever. I will be back probably with more vintage last next week. Take it easy.